This conference will now be recorded. There are benefits to all the players here today. The end winner for the entire benefit process is the citizen that is calling 911 when they're having their worst day of their life. That has always been the first and foremost process with the closest unit being dispatched. It is a efficient form of service delivery. It is the most efficient and effective manner possible. If you took an example of a fire and structure at 98 in River, and all of a sudden you're dispatched to one fire department and you've got a fire coming in and you've got to wait for somebody to get there and call for help. That is not the closest resources available. Our units would still be dispatched, but we know the station at 90, 98 and State Avenue is also to the next closest station. We have to beat us there about three minutes because of the close proximity. So at the end focal point, we've got the entire process of automatic aid. No one agency loses their ability to control, dictate, or still guide their process of how the response goes. It just means that the end user, the 911 caller, the citizen, is the most beneficiary out of the entire process because it's putting that emergency service, regardless of the jurisdiction or the name, at their disposal at the quickest amount of time possible. We know nationwide our demand for services only continues to grow. We know that here at the local level as well. We are stuck with the process of doing more with less. From nationwide results from 1980 to 2003, the total number of responses in fire service and emergency medical services have doubled. Medical aid responses have also lost at more than that. Fire responses have dropped by 47% due to an excellent fire prevention program, and mutual aid calls have more than tripled due to staffing, push carrying ranks, and everything else. The fact that the population has also grown exponentially in that 30 year time frame and has moved out to where city county is expanding further and further, and government services are slowly starting to expand those services to catch up with. It's been one of the identified points of the United States Fire Administration and the National Fire uh, Caucus. Uh, in 2015, Arizona responded to almost 800 calls. In 2022, we ran over 1,200 calls for service. That is a large percentage jump just in the community that only had between 2002. 2010 to 400 person population adjustment uh, according to the United States Census Bureau. 
it's also part of the best practices. The best practices allowing us one for the closest portion of dispatch, but directs us to the compliance with federal energy standards. You've heard Mr. Bishop talk about NFPA standards. We've talked about 1710. We've talked about <clears throat> dispatch turnaround protocol time. We've also talked about ISO or insurance uh, services organization and OSHA <clears throat> applications. In 2019, we dropped our ISO rating from four to a two to be based on part of our mutual aid response and our response capabilities. This would further bring that in line. However, according to the NFPA and most of our standards, according to the United States Fire Service, United States Fire Administration, we need at least 20 people on the scene before we start a municipal fire attack. Currently, today, we do not meet that as our current response protocol. It allows us more hands to initiate complex and local tasks immediately. And the biggest benefit for the Blind Dock County at this point in time is for a streamlined dispatch communication for all three agencies. Currently, if you were to go down to the Blind Dock County, Communication Center, you're going to sit there and realize we have three fire departments working on three different dispatch channels with three dispatchers sitting there. So if there's a fire in the dispatch at the Edwardsville tonight, and our automatic aid responder spring system calls, they dispatch us, then they have to go to our responder spring channel, we say responder spring units, and then as we get on scene and call for Kansas City, Kansas mutual aid, then they have to get over to Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas, City, Kansas channel, and dispatch that. Under the proposed automatic aid agreement, all three of those radio channels will be merged into one. One dispatch channel for all three agencies. Then we'll be assigned out task path channels depending upon the complexity of the fire, whether it's the eastern or western side, which is getting a little bit further into the operational concepts. But the biggest thing is, is putting all the agencies on one radio channel. We're monitoring all three cities at the same time. So if we hear something kicking off in downtown Kansas City, they start going to a second or greater on fire. And they start pulling some West End resources. We know that we may be getting a call to go to 78 and Schwartz for a medical call because they are out of resources. Or we will hear when they are status zero on ambulances and shut down three engine companies to upgrade and bring on all their ambulances because of the influx of ambulance calls. Also, with that, it sets there and streamlines the dispatch procedure because, again, we are only working one dispatcher on one channel and not trying to bounce across three different channels. Next slide, Sean. Please. In 2016, we ran 671 calls and 286 other calls for service. Even though it's listed as fire, we would not have 286 fires in the city, or we would have a serious fire problem that we would need to address. 2017, we had an uptick. 2018, we had changes that occurred with our false alarms. We started with more stringent false alarm uh, enforcement policy. The city had also created a false alarm fee scale. We also have readapted and worked more with our community partners at the UG on counseling for aging and personnel that were using the 911 system that did not have 911 calls. So we reduced <coughs> of our call volume uh, exponentially in 2018 due to some of those changes because we were anticipating that our services were getting used for non essential calls tied up on situations that were completely preventable. And in 2019, at the start, the, towards the end of the year, is when COVID hit. And we noticed we had a, almost 100 run calls different in the ambulance service alone. The ambulance calls were dropped because people did not want to go to the hospital because they didn't want to run the risk of getting COVID. That is no worse than any other jurisdiction that I've talked to with chiefs in other communities across the nation. Yes, calls went up for the COVID relations. Most people drove to the hospital, but 911 calls for services in most places had decreased because of the COVID risk factor that people were scared. So then in 2021, we started coming out of COVID and we saw our spike again going back to pre COVID time. And in 2022, we ran 893 calls for service on the ambulance side and 332 calls for service on the fire and the west side. During the 2022, we only ran 25 false alarms that were determined false alarms because of our enforcement and code enforcement fee schedule and us staying on top of false alarms. So we did not have a rise in false alarm rise. We did not have a rise in lift assists or other non essential, non urgent 911 calls if somebody was using the system. We had a larger influence of calls because the demographic of people calling 911 is changed. Now, because the backlog of personnel waiting in the ER, they think the quickest way to get to the hospital is go via ambulance. And they're finding out the hard way when they drop them off at the triage desk and leave them out front that the ambulance ride just costs you some money. 
that doesn't get you in the back quicker. Most of our calls in this community are still low duty calls that are sick people that are demanding to go to the hospital and we take them. But we anticipated back in 2017 that we were following along a nationwide trend of about a 3% increase every year in the rise of fire and EMS calls. This is kind of pretty evident in 2021 and 2022. Chief, can I ask, ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Are these all Edwardsville calls? These are, well, so in 2021, we made 104 calls, fire and EMS calls to Bonner Creek. We made four calls in Kansas. In 2022, we made 114 calls in Bonner Creek to fire and EMS, and we made two calls in Kansas again, and seven calls in these other locations. Thank you. There are some other slides in there that address Okay. That. Thank you. Uh, again, at the entire time that our Increase went up. If you take out those mutual aid calls we had, we still saw about a four percent increase. The community of Bonner Springs saw a ten percent increase in their call volume, and the city of Kansas City, Kansas saw almost an eleven percent increase in their call volume. There has just been a large change in transition within the population of what constitutes a nine one one call. The population of the older generation of I and want to sit there and not go to the hospital and give an ambulance. Has gone by the wayside and everybody's been taught. We've done a great job of preaching get hurt and call 911. That is what it is for. So we're starting to see where that is influx into the rise of the call for that. Out of those call volumes, every one of those years of fires, we average about 14 fires involving structures. Not all of them are complete total loss structures. A lot of times it's a small fire that's still on the stovetop that we don't require any more assistance on. But nine times on average, 2016, we have to call for help on structure fire because that is beyond our control of what our initial response capabilities are. <coughs> that is only a fire in a closed livable structure. We do not track a structure as an outdoor structure that we sit there and throw into that data because that to us is not a change in demographic that causes adverse harm on somebody. If it's your garden shed, I'm going to come up there, I'm going to show up, I'm going to put it out. But that is not a living structure. We determine a structure fire based off of living space and our data collection. And on average, like I said, that's about nine times per year that we have. In that time frame in 2017 and in 2023, we've had one fatal fire in each one of those two years. The automatic aid agreement, the, the amount of the damage done would not have changed the result of fatality. But we're still sitting there taking that risk because you have had fatal fire data that you hadn't before. Okay. Next slide, please, Sean Paul. So there are concerns. Different medical protocols. Ourselves and Bonner Springs have the same medical director and the same medical protocol that we follow the Johnson County Med Act. Kansas City, Kansas Fire Department has a different medical director and a different set of medical protocols. How does that affect when we go to a call? Well, from Kansas City, Kansas, we we're coming in here to deal with the medical call. We start our medical protocols now in our format. They are lane. And when their paramedics will take the transfer, they will switch them to stick to their protocols and do what you need. Uh, contracting the company here, Mr. May, is an indemnification for the limited liability. They pick up with their protocols, medical protocols, go, and they keep going forward. So there's not this conflict of, oh, you did something that we're not used to. They understand that we have different protocols, they understand they have different protocols. The whole goal is we get there first, we start within our protocol format, they show up to take over patient care transport, they are now underneath their protocol format. The same thing as we go into Kansas City, Kansas to make a medical call, just like we would in Bonner Springs, we follow underneath our protocol and we do not question what they started. Our medics stay within their line of their medical protocol because that is what our doctor allows our paramedics or so much like to do. So each medical director signs what the paramedic scope of practice is. Both medical directors, ours for us in Bonner Springs, Kansas City, Kansas Fire Department medical director, have been briefed as part of this dispatch protocol, or not dispatch, automatic aid agreement, and both of the doctors are confident in their protocols and our ability to work together because we've worked on teams before. So there is none of the concern about the dispatch or the medical protocol difference. There are different ways that both agencies, or all three agencies, Send resources to medical calls. <clears throat> if you go to Kansas City, Kansas, most medical calls are going to get you a pumper and an ambulance sent right off the bat. The same with Bonner Springs. They're going to get you a pumper and an ambulance right off the bat. 
we do not send a pump or an ambulance off the back because we have to always sit there and worry about that second call due to the way that we had to implement the EMS system in 2014. We do send a fire apparatus on five critical natures of call that are dispatched. That is any type of chest pain that is cardiac in nature. Anything that is a stroke-like symptom, difficulty breathing, an unconscious, unresponsive, unknown condition, and then any major trauma. Those top five will get a fire truck and an ambulance from us here regardless. That will not change in the city of Edwards. The same happens right now if we have both of our ambulances out. The remaining crew will sit there and still respond to our first response processor while we wait on the arrival of an additional ambulance. Whether you have stubbed your toe, you have a stomach ache, or you sit there and slight cast your finger off because you have to set state knives, that process is still starting before we sit there and get the other ambulance around. That is not going to change. Kansas City, Kansas has somebody sit there and they go to status zero or cannot have an ambulance on 78 from Schwartz. And they need an ambulance or the next closest thing available from here. Humphrey 20 is still going to make that response at our station or one of their fire trucks will make that response to start that first response medical call. And then our ambulance will be sent to sit there and deal with the patient transfer. This is not to sit there and mirror the way that any one agency sits there and deploys the resource. We have sat there and decided right now that we are not going to sit there and dump those pieces unless there's a fire that is very close to the city limits because we are now looking at it all that requires two ambulances that are there. We still are going to pride ourselves in keeping our city covered with some of our resources as much as possible. We're not anticipating this large jump of we're going to be down to the summer bale on every fire in Kansas City, Kansas. Logistically, it would be impossible for it to happen when they have over 100 employees at 18 stations every day they're shut. I have a question. Too. Yes, ma'am. Um, so this is the only thing that I was thinking of. I love this idea. I love this. But um, so is it possible to ask KCK? Because what I'm thinking is both of our, if our both of our ambulances are out, say there's a wreck on I-7 and they need, they need uh, Edwardsville. Um, is it possible to see if a box from KCK can stage, like at Station 6, to get to our area faster if both of our ambulances are out? Yes, ma'am. I'll just kind of explain that when we close out because that's part of the automatic vehicle locator to okay. talk about in the process. Okay. okay. So what it does is dispatch every 1,500, I think they back there someplace of a second, the ABLs will ping and sit there and say where the unit is at. So part of this plan is units are being pulled from one particular area. There are designs and implementations to move either closer to city limits or let the agency know, such as Med 20, which is out of stage 20. You may be going into Edwardsville because you're going to be the next closest medical incident if something's going on. Um, like I said, there are going to be those rare occasions that we sit there and we possibly have both units going to another city. Our experience for Kansas City, Kansas, would not be for the medical call. It would be for either the complicated rescue, the mass casualty, or the structure fire based off the plan. We're anticipating that to be five and ten times a year and really kind of less than five times a year. Because when we go now to Bonner Springs on a call, I start calling back full time personnel and I start calling back part time personnel to bring them back in to cover our city. When we would have this in place, stations that are not actively sent as part of that regional last response would also start moving closer to help provide protection for the existing gap in recovery. So instead of just one station sitting there going, oh, we're completely adequately, or we just completely depleted resources in Bonner and Edwardsville, we're just going to stay over here. Through the talks with the chiefs is when we would start doing station fills or moving closer to the city limit line and sending an apparatus to sit there and provide that cover because, again, everything here is driven towards the residents of Wyandotte County, the residents of Edwardsville, the residents of Bonner Springs, the residents of Kansas City, Kansas, especially in the western end where we are short of resources, that that is the first priority for Paramount every time. Um, we sit there and talk about what a typical structural fire attack response plan is. I have that covered here in another couple of slides. It increases our minimum response capability to what will show up to a fire in the city of Edwardsville, the city of Bonner Springs, and it mirrors very closely what KCK is implementing. So it 
provides a standardized response across the county. Now, if we don't need all those resources, we send them back home. But if we know we're going to be out for two hours and we have a spare bumper because it's part of that call, we can send them back to set on the city line or set in our station. They'll provide coverage for those big areas. We sit there and talk about any differences of strategy and tactics. Um, part of that has been identified in the new plan that Kansas City, Kansas has introduced to their crews. We are actually wearing part of that because we were looking at redoing our attack procedures for our SOPs and policies. Do not think that they drove this down anybody's particular process and said we had to follow this. From the time that we sat there and started working with this at the chief's level, the idea of the plan was based off of this automatic aid agreement that if we're going to sit there and have a plan, then why not have everybody on the same sheet? That helps to standardize the entire fire operation. Don't have friction or conflict occurring on the We still manage to maintain control of our active policies and procedures to dictate our day to day operations, our day to day responses, and the automatic data grid. What type of preparation training is needed? A lot of it is going to be the different face to face working together relationship. We started strong. We started last week and we have a plan since we've been in Kansas and Kansas and it's going on throughout the county of Kansas City. We need the same tools as far as your local state. Seven eight to ten seven. Um, and get it out with them on a daily basis. We have been participating for over two months in the daily video conference calls that occur with Casey Case on the phone. So there are faces to names, names to faces, personnel um, that could the nine years go longer. I did not have access to the parents level of the command staff that I've had in the last ninety days as part of the plan. How will joint training be performed? Hosting a new gun support training with specialized forces such as the Hazmat Team and the Technical Rescue Team at Kansas City, Kansas in the past year. That same implementing format is going to occur on a quarterly basis or annual basis as part of the plan. <coughs> and it'll be hosted between the three cities. It's not going to be where we have to go specifically to one location to do it. The whole thought process is that we're going to do a hazmat exercise. We're going to find the high risk hazard in Garner. We have the highest risk hazard in Western Fort Smith Lionel County. Well, I'm sure the district. We've ran time. We usually been the host facility because we have the biggest risk. Same thing with some of the technical risks. So that'll be shared across the entire lake. But the chiefs, or the training chiefs, will sit down and create the director's training plan of what they want to accomplish. Working on crew cohesion, communication, and response efficiency are the three tactical priorities we're going to have working on that day. Variable limitation. How is it going to sit there and be determined if it's fair across the board? Right now, it looks like we're running the bar and training 83 times last year for a few months. So, that's going to have a reduction in what kind of expenses over here, but we won't be the only human in this facility that needs to be on training. We're going to sit there and reduce the training. But still, reduce the world with a post for assets on training. But the same is well here. I don't always have to stand that same table 169 times. Where we are reducing our staff limitations to accommodate the same thing. Well, there are follow ups that are going along with the process of how we're going to sit here and determine who to appoint and how to do it. But there are three annuals that we will execute with the backup three annual appointments that are going to help to take off some of that pressure that is on one of our annual appointments. So that's going to sit here and do some of that reduction to determine that. The other thing is we've got two of those things. And very limitation is to not reduce the size of the group to the vast position. Bar strength is 
Bonner have the equipment that we have or more or better or less or are they staff or equipment wise are they in good shape? Yes or no. So they have more pieces of that correct. They are they have a new uh, ladder apparatus that was released in March of uh, four. Uh, they are looking at a replacement of the engine service for the baby. Currently, we are dispatched to the car model of uh, a Jeep Tomcat available. Our engine is not aging along with what may be standard in the car level. We don't do first hand on the car level or any car contract. <clears throat> this is a call to the 200 block of State Way Street back in August. Remember, it was like 109 degrees. Our aim was to transport the previous fire that occurred an hour and a half prior to. And it's not clear to KU yet. But when that starting fire came in at 200 block of Blake Street, we had one engine of three personnel and myself. Two from Bonner Train and Officer Deputy Chief, two other engines. Our initial attack, we got off the scene and the police officer reported they were reporting kids could still be in the house for nine people. Nine. That's four. So it takes four minutes for Bonner Train to show up. Four. Four. There's not enough people to do that number with. Our goal is to provide that, that best plan. All right. There are times that we had, do have back to back critical medical calls for critical, critical calls resulting in the time of fire. The automatic aid process will stream, better streamline this and better serve our citizens when they might make their call for help or give us more resources when we set and get that call. Not everybody. It's going to have that large of an issue that it has to put minutes on the map, especially on the time that we sit there and look at most of our major critical medical conditions. So if we were to sit there and have one cardiac chest pain call occur here in Old County, so I have a <clears throat> cardiac chest pain call in the city of 102nd Riverview Drive. That's four and a half to six minutes to get there. There's an ambulance set three minutes away at 98 to stay there. The whole principle behind the automatic aid is to make efficiency the priority for everybody in the county. If we were to sit there and have both ambulances out, we're having to call for help from somebody else. We still have to do it, even as it is currently today. It just streams like that first thing. Possibly. So I'm on that slide. But if we take what this new process would look like, that same fire, even if our ambulance was out, we would get 21 personnel instead of 23 on the initial response. National Fire Protection 1710 and 1720 standards call for 20 personnel within a matter of 10 minutes to be corralled on scene. We are exceeding that with three people. However, we are getting five pieces of firefighting apparatus, two ambulances, at least two chief officers, and a safety car that we afford. We don't need all of it. We send the non-necessary home. That August, we sat there and ended up having four pieces of Kansas City, Kansas City, because 109 degrees, you get a fireman for about 17 minutes. And then the heat index is making it so unbearable that you have to start wearing about heat stroke and heat stress than fireman. But three minutes makes a difference in the 
December 24th of 2020, we had a fire at 98 in River. It took us four minutes and 59 seconds to get on scene. We lost a council member's house because he's already been through the roof and running the roof line that night. When Sixes was in the house, not a quarter mile away. That the secretary had put that unit on scene and was a solid three minutes before we would have got there and could have made a difference. Don't know, could have, would have, should have. But that is the talking about the efficiency of the process of it doesn't matter anymore. It wouldn't matter which chief shows up. It's the first chief officer starts making those tactical decisions. It is removing barriers that have been a problem for over eight years in this county. When we sit there and talk about large fires, that was one of those we had a lot of resources besides this one in August. But we also had a large fire in August back in December of 2003. That required 13 pieces of apparatus to come in on the beach way call. We were out for seven and a half hours on the call. We had volunteer departments from Lemore County coming in to help staff to make sure, sure we had covered the back end. There are few and far between, but the process of the aid is not something that is not unknown to everybody around here and helps make us more efficient at our call. So if we look at the medical call in the same process, <clears throat> currently if we have one medical call and we just got a two-person ambulance out on a low acuity call, we would sit there and, and take our remaining crew from the ambulance and pumper, put it into an additional two-person ambulance and send them to the next call. If that crew, all five, are on a critical cardiac or one of the top five calls, Myself or Dave Millen or somebody else is coming to help us make that call, and we're calling for an ambulance to the next closest provider. If they're not answering up right back, dispatch calls the captain on the engine and says, We got another call in your community. Who would you like us to send? We still have to dictate who we're sending, even if we say the next closest. Same concept to sit there and allow us. If we look at 78 and Schwartz, and it would be a pump of 20 and a KCK medic. KCK is down to status one, and that means the KUs are not close. It would only be us having to send our two person ambulance over to San Diego to help make that call to 78. We would not have to send our pump and our ambulance over.
extended. So it's not just call specific and or sit there. It eliminate a lot of the guesswork on dispatchers of saying, here you go. It provides a more robust situation for the response across the entire county. Next slide, please, John Paul. How is this going to change our call volume? It's going to change, yes and no. It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to make thousands of calls and we're going to sit there and come back in and say, oh my God, we just can't reach that. I'm going to break that down here in the next couple slides. Will we be running every call in Kansas City? No. We are going to be responding to Kansas City because it's going to sit there and drop the city limits, just the same as we run into Bonner Square. If we are going to Farmerdale for a fire, we have got some very big problems with Wyandotte County. We've got a huge issue. We may at those points in time, if you have large fires downtown, get reallocated to cover parts of Station 20s and the city of Edwards and move to Secretary and still provide and maybe have a larger response area. Our goal again is to still always have coverage here. The same goes as like we did in 2015. We have a long term incident again at another large industrial complex here. We start calling in another resource to come back in and back. Does not take away our ability to backfill with our part time and full time employees. The other benefit is Kansas City, Kansas has over 100 employees on duty every day. So the, the realm of we're going to every medical call and legends and every medical call in Piper is not practical. There are times that there are status zero ambulances and they start moving their resources to play against the status zero. The same thing goes into it. But if we are leaving Providence with a patient and they're at status zero and they get a call at 76 in the state for a traffic accident, we can get set there and put on that response card for a traffic accident because we're the closest unit to there. This batch still covers that we're there, but they are at their status to where they have to go with their units to sit there and call them. Predominantly, the old existing Delaware Council that runs everything from about Station 20 through here. Um, is what's going to sit there and kind of disappear and be melded into one response area. Will we be running into every call in Bonner Springs? We have not never been the primary response agency in Bonner Springs. Everybody's like, oh my gosh, we we'll have to make all the calls in Bonner Springs. 114 times last year. 104 times the year before. Prior to that, the bad worker relationships, they weren't calling a whole lot, they were calling the HP Cat. When you sit there and look at the city and an agency that has over 1,400 calls long on their side, we are less than 10% of their call volume. We've had a response in there, so no, I would not say we're anywhere close to the primary response. We are getting calls when they're the same boat we are. They have got no ambulances there. They were an all-volunteer agency and with no staffing on fire trucks until this year, which is a part-time model. So when they would have back-to-back -back calls, somebody would have to help them out. Remember. 169 times last year, we had a call from somebody else if we didn't set there and deploy our model that we had. But they have aided us, just not as a safe, fair amount, which, as Mr. Matisse agreed to earlier, they are aware of that. Their new company chief was aware of that. They have made the commitment to hiring people to have more fairness in there. They are looking at a very similar model for staffing the way we do. But again, right now, they are only one ambulance that serves. We don't have a shop. As we start getting age on items and everything else, sometimes you can have 20 people sitting in the station. You cannot put this patient in a fire truck and take it to the hospital without having ramifications for the state board of EMS. If you don't have ambulances that are in service because of mechanical issues, there are going to be those times. But next slide, please, John Carl. We've given those numbers before. I'm sorry, it was 115, not 114. 85 of those were for EMS, 14 traffic accidents, 16 fires, 26 were canceled around. We anticipate a decrease of about 65 calls per year going out of Bonner Springs because of this. Now, we're anticipating about an increase of 50 calls per year looking at the western data provided by Kansas City Kansas Fire Department compared to this two. Okay. And that's because of some areas along 435 from Holiday to the bridge, I-70 from 435 to almost K-7 that they cover, that they were having to send resources from Further down, that we would be closer to cover. So some of those numbers that we look at there, that is a, that is an estimate that I have pretty confident in saying that we are not looking at hundreds, we're not looking at thousands of calls, we're looking at about fifty. I just have a point of clarification because you said this. Do you mean that 
that this the implementation of this particular this mutual aid yes. will decrease <coughs> about 65 I've called. Yes. And is that in addition to what Bonner Springs is ramping up the full time service as well, or is it just simply that one agreement is going to make it? Well, no, I think I think the uh, combination of the staffing and the agreement will decrease about 65 calls. I, I'd like to come back in here and say, oh, oops, I was my number wrong because I'm 120 calls out, but you know that's yet to be seen because of various factors, but like I said, looking at staffing and just looking at where the call of where we made in Bonner Springs, if anything, I think the 65 is going to be the, the best number one seat because it, it increased. So you're talking about almost more than half of the call volume going out. I think it's a good point, though, that if you drive up and down 435, right, there's there's two jurisdictions there that we're going to be some you know, kind of hops. And so when you think about these calls coming up and the variations, what you'll see is we have a number of accidents out there where our police department, for example, is dispatched first and then they're kind of trying to figure out where it's at because people who are calling 911 don't know exactly where they're at, what town they're in, so they're just sending all of that. So we could see an increase. We're going to be the closest on at, at 832 and 435. So that's a good point to point out that. The, we're going there anyway, but we may be the lead in, in all of that on a pretty regular basis because if it's done by GIS and automatic vehicle locators, they're going to say, you're the closest one to send out there. It doesn't mean Casey can <coughs> come, and they usually do, but that's, that's you should expect that. that there could be some variation. Also, just to uh, tie into that, on the east side of town, where I worked all the time, we ran with Missouri like that all the time. Nobody knew on I, I, I had nobody over by the Guadalupe Center. They didn't know it was like that at the KU. So it, it's a common occurrence. People don't know where they're at. 94 Street's another perfect example for the KUS. And we've had a head on collision coming home from some narrow roads. But who are they send it first? Well, we're going to go with Edwardville and then send Casey Davis. Right, Tim? Yes, sir. Next slide, no problem. Like I said, we're anticipating a, a slight decrease and a slight increase. Now, still factoring in though, my recommendation is to always consider that we're going to always look at a 3% gradual increase to the new trend of nationwide response. That, that's going to factor in there as well. How many times are they going to come help us? Million dollar question. Based off of empirical data last year, and the year before, when we look at it, we were averaging about 39 times we called Bonner Springs and six times we called Kansas City, Kansas Fire Department. We almost hold those numbers to be a neutral response. We don't anticipate that that's going to change that much because if we have a large spike of outgoing calls that we're calling them in, then I need to relook at some program or some process that has failed on our side. Now, like I said, in the average, we have about nine structure fires with fire help a year out of the 14 plus that are lost. That's not those every couple of years because we had that bad rash year where you get 15 or 16 fires. That's not the fact that we just come out of another year or one of the first years of exceptional drought that's been in a drought status for four years in the state of Kansas. The forecast is we're going to have a wet winter. Next year's summer forecast is not going to get any better. The, the, fall, the foliage and, and the fuel that are on the ground are going to dry out rapidly next spring and it's only going to get worse. So those numbers can fluctuate, but based off of what we've looked at, our times that we have them, it's going to sit there and probably have a slight increase just based off of what Mr. Z said. The areas of 435, 94, parts, 832. <clears throat> we already have double up response areas with them. And then there's going to be the 435 and I-70 corridor which is notoriously been one of those that is favored more towards KCK than us, that may get cleared up a little bit more because of the fact that we've got agencies on both sides now to get on 435. So there is some justification. I would like to say that, you know, we're talking about 100 or less a year. It's not going to sit there and cause any great concern. If there's anything more than that, um, then that's when me and two other chiefs are sitting down going, what's, what's changed? But it's not the thousands that I've heard about. Right? I said there all of a sudden think, oh, you know, going to KCK. Well, yeah, they make 56,000 calls a year. That doesn't mean that we're taking a third of them or a quarter of them or anything else. Because when you look at their heat maps, the majority of their responses are from 
52nd Street on east into what is Old Town and a part of downtown Armourdale, Turner, and all that. So that is where we secondary realize we're not going to have that huge of an influx in the falls and Kent City Kansas. Next slide, please, John. So I'll talk about 45 times what we average calling for a so you mentioned 435 and 7. So we may be So, requirements and needs. Everybody's like, oh, here we go. Now that she's going to come in and walk in and we're going to have a bunch of money. So, most of everything that we have is covered in here except for an item identified in the HOA plan. Of how do we find out where these are? Automatic vehicle. That is the biggest expense we have in that is hardware and software issue. So, our CAD system is set up. They bought it from Power Tech Camp. They want the stuff books and their heads and their RMS and all of that for several hundreds of thousands of dollars. <coughs> and incorporated automatic vehicle in there. The city of Evansville did not buy into that system at that point in time. We were confident that we had the right RMS that we had. This was right before I got hired here. Um, and 
everything. And I will say in my decision, whoever made that one time, not to know what I'm at right now. Our current RMS system has interfaces and has systems. We use technology to help our RMS and our CAD operations in the field. Our biggest problem is the setup we seem to have some software and upgrade, hardware upgrade. We are almost at the end of life on tablets that we're going to sit there and start identifying and we're going to drive everybody south because we'd like to try to use some hardware that's on in 2024 to implement this. That is about a $10,000 expenditure to replace seven tablets across the board with software to it. It's a $1,000 a year annual fee after that to integrate into the CAD dispatch software downtown to this power technology. Dave, am I correct? That is the biggest expenditure that we have for cleaners is automatic data filter. We have current we have current hardware that is almost at the end of its life. I regret that we didn't have a better idea with this when we put the 24 buttons together to identify it, but we do have armor front this that can be used on the signal system at least for that front. Now, the unit redesignation, the jockey are treated as identifiers, kind of treated as identifiers, monitor springs is done, all that. That is a $5,000 expense. It will be done sometime over the next calendar year that's <coughs> the budget. The biggest headache is the reclassification and reprogramming of annual regulation. That one is for free. That is managed <coughs> by EPU. That is a matter of us bringing them out on station and having them plug the cable in. Template that is being used by KCK and us and Barnum. It's been agreed upon on our meeting that we had back in <coughs> September. The last one chiefs so of what the radio maintenance look like for all the channels. Like I said, we're going to use no more three different dispatch channels, there's no more 12 different attachment channels across three different banks. We're back down to eight tap channels, one dispatch channel, and it's just a matter of us re programming that one site in every one of our trucks. Darren, Darren Darrell from EPU has made it as a day, a day and a half worth of work that can be done right after you. Now, the implementation date that was implemented is on January. We will be on the mobile system until 1 January, which we will be <coughs> at 8 a.m. How do we do that? We program the radios ahead of time. We put our existing template on the second bank, which is already going to stay the same. We program the radios the last time on main dispatch channel, always on that second bank. Radio channel because we've got to run it off the back. So, all we will be doing is work off that second night until 8 a.m. on the morning of January 1st, which is going to be a big top five dollars profit. That is where we are looking at our biggest expenses being the unit hardware software update. Reprogramming the radios, does that create a challenge for communicating with our police at all, or is that just switching the channel to get to them? I would love to sit there and tell you I could talk to my cops, but they're on a trippy band. Okay. They could hear us, but we can talk to them. So, usually when I sit there and have to have a face to face with a police officer, I go walk and talk. Yeah. Uh, they, they usually hear for us when we sit there and we don't put them on the radio and tell them something, they'll start looking for us. But 99% of the time, the majority of our officers, when we're on the scene with them, uh, as soon as they see a chief officer or the captain, they are out front, right up to us, down our duck on the incident. We still need to sit there and tell you, you know, because of the challenges that they're afraid of. Is that, a, is that by design, Tim, or is that by, is that a, an equipment challenge? Probably by design. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know. 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 I don't know.
communication is never open to our officers and the firefighters. It's never been an issue. Um, in 2015, when we had the fire, we did have cases against the Saturday morning. And up until we were here in uh, August, that is a good just so I understand the change in the guidance and all the systems on our channel. Having everybody on to a dispatch channel, we can sign tax numbers or guidance of fire. Puts everybody on the same guidance channel. Sit there and do a four round time, sit there and wait. Well, the hand, take the radio channel, put the stone down and back down, turn up a knob and the list, and everybody's on that channel. And again, uh, I will take any questions that come that way. I hope we can answer everything we can get. This, as far as the street speech is concerned, the biggest winner in this entire process is. Chief, I just had a couple of questions um, that you probably have a quick answer to. I may have just not heard it right or not quite followed along. Um, so it's uh, the example of K32 and 435. There's a medical emergency, not a fire, but uh, the ambulance call. Um, if if it's in Kansas City, Kansas, but Edwardsville is the first response there. When Kansas and Kansas shows up, do they take over, or do we keep that and have to go sit at the hospital with that patient? Let me go a little bit further east. Let's say 88th and K32. Yeah, so we, we get there first. Does KCK take over when they get there, or do we have to go to the hospital? Let's just call it an ambulance. Like, it's just an ambulance call, no fire truck. All right, we'll go there and fire truck. If the patient does not sign a release form that is delivered in his hand, he will see that transport all the way from that scene. We drop off to the hospital, deliver a release, gather all the wood, and bring the patient in the back. Okay, so we, we keep them. So say we have one of our ambulances with that patient, say they're at Providence from 80th and K32. And then we have another ambulance call at, I don't know, K7 and K32. So we're the first response for whatever reason there. We go there, so we have two ambulances out. And this kind of, um, I think, is what Councilman Adcox was asking. At that point, do we have in the mutual aid or, or agreement among the chiefs that someone's sliding closer from Kansas to Kansas, slide, like what, physically what moving closer? Where resources are being pulled, KCK does it now when they're starting to move the ambulances because they're going down, especially. Never start seeing that anomaly start here. High storm, weather event, or sudden center, having those two people, <coughs> then they would start looking at where is their next closest trip. They may sit there and call upon the points out to say, You're standing down the hall to pick up the, the ambulance, and we start heading towards 435 and K32 to help cover that field. Still, Edwards will get back to the hospital. Okay. So, it's, it's a sliding process with apparatus all across the map. So they would be physically moving closer they would, to respond to our call. They would be moving physically closer. Since upon, they had already cleared their distance, Providence was 10 minutes, and knowing that our average time at Providence is 15 to 20 minutes, and then we get the call to K7 and K32 to take our second ambulance over there, it may become that determination of dispatchers like they've been on the clock now for at Providence, are you clear? Oh, yeah, we're clear. Then it may just be from the point of view preparing for another call and they would go stand by in your station because, you know, you think there's just as much time to sit there and get the scene right, but we're already back in the scene to get to the problem. Yeah. Now, if you took that same patient yeah. to KU, yeah. and you're talking about a 17 to 20 minute response time back here, then we would sit there and see where they would sit there and start moving them towards the city. 
Okay, that was my concern is those examples where we're kind of out and then maybe someone in Old Town has a heart attack and then we have to get to them sooner. So I can see where the that would is benefit. What part is the most self harm is you're going to have to get up and go battle and set on somebody to the other side, whether you like it or not. You're going to sit there and stand by the station. That's just part of it. Yes, the whole design is just like Johnson County, especially during that act. You start sliding pieces around, and you don't have any one particular area that is undercover because there's other issues going on. Okay. And so I see that definitely being, um, bringing peace of mind to folks at the north end right now. If they're, my understanding is it doesn't matter, even if we have ambulances in Edwardsville, if a medical emergency comes out at 98th and Riverview, then sixes will be responding first anyway because they're the closest. Um, the other question I had, and this might be a little bit too much into the weeds on dispatch, if we're going down to one dispatch. I've called Missouri before and been on the phone um, on hold 20 minutes before I talk to an actual dispatch person. Are we going to get so bogged down with KCK calls that we have a longer wait time to get to a dispatcher? Right now, one of the benefits of Wyandotte County as a whole is we're just a minute. We have a 911 dispatcher pick up the phone call in Wyandotte County and get the police fire and that's right now stress and nurse. We don't have the backlog that we can't see with Missouri. So 911 just keeps both automatically roll over and just call the 911. However, in Wyandotte County, there are no less than four additional call trains to bring in the incoming 911. And then you have anywhere between a two and four fire dispatchers to up on one side, and I think it's up to six or seven police dispatchers on the other side. So the problem is we're not much short on the actual dispatcher side because the calls are stacking up like they are in Kansas City, Missouri. They're getting them out over to the other side. So Three dispatchers on on one call on the radio. That's two other dispatchers that are sitting there doing those other calls to come in, taking those, routing them out, and saying this is not an emergency we have in there. So it's not that initial nine hundred one coming in and taking those calls in and saying, "Oh, here you go." What happened? And I think the pro the point he was making was that they're not reducing the number of dispatchers. What they're doing is retemplating the radio. So that there will be a central dispatch for all the fire apparatus that's there, ambulance or whatever. But those other bodies will still be there. The call takers will still be in place. I didn't understand that there would be any reduction. There's no reduction. It's in just like we're talking about trying to hire on the ones we did. It's centralizing <clears throat> rather than segmenting how they're dispatched now on a, on a physical basis. Okay. And so you don't see any concerns with that or, or radio traffic? No, or ma'am, because like the, way the, the way the dispatch chairs are set up, if you have a primary dispatcher, Deals with monitoring all three radio channels. Okay. You have a second chair that deals with incoming calls, and a third chair for the staff that deals with taking the calls. You still only got one person talking on all three radio channels. That one person now only has to deal with one channel and then one attack channel, yeah. okay. or two attack channels. The two to three other people are still there to take some of that call volume off that eliminates the stack of calls in the 911 center. Because if you go down there and it is at one o'clock in the morning, Sit there, you may get five calls coming at the same time for the same incident. And as soon as we're sitting there going, Oh, well, you know, 98 is in Riverview, there's a fire. One, two, is man, we understand we've already got two come out. That second or third person is having enough to take up that next one to stop back all the on the initial 911 call and train. All they're doing is police fire, ambulance, what's the emergency, and routing to the two sides of the building. And then that allows the primary dispatcher to only concentrate on. On the radio that are about there's no resources to deal with the ICC. The other two that are not on that radio to take some of that pressure off of that. Um, so that has always been that template. It's just reformatting, it's not reorganizing <coughs> or reducing the number of dispatchers that are in there. Thank you. So, so Chief, who uh, ultimately makes a decision on who goes where? Like, let's just say that. They're stuck down here because of a train, and there's a heart attack at 110th and Riverview, and the 911 call goes in to dispatch. And does dispatch say there was a train in Edwardsville? We can't get them up there. How's that going to work out? We're going to uh, just like we do now. The dispatch is hung up by a train. That call comes in, or even assuming that's hung up by a train, they are going to that next closest unit 
which would be KCK. KCK and North Star. And then the other thing I was going to wait was uh, there's going to have to be some pretty big changes at the 911 dispatch center, correct? Most of those have already been started uh, with the process. Uh, I'm going to let Dave kind of answer that real quick because he's got his hand. So, uh, to answer your first question, what the study is about that. That would probably be a good like, idea. <laughs> yeah, I've got a lot of questions. This is this is kind of sprung on. I, I got this Friday, I think, Thursday or Friday. And I'm going to, I mean, I like what I'm hearing. I like everything about what I'm hearing. So, so to answer the question about the dispatch uh, protocol, <coughs> that's going to be built into the system. So the configurated dispatch system has a system. And then they apply polygons in a mapping system to those points. So they say, uh, if our fire truck is in the station, they would apply an 80 second delay because on average, the national average is an 80 second delay to get out of the door into the fire truck and roll out of the station. So it automatically applies that 80 second delay. When we get on the radio and say we have a train delay, we run the numbers and it will dispatch the average number of seconds that were delayed by the train. So once it applies that, it would pop up to the dispatcher and say, now the next closest units are going to be this unit or the next unit. Um, so whereas before, today and until this is passed, uh, we would have to make that decision and it may not be consistent every single time the computer will apply those delays automatically. Um, and with the vehicle location, with it knowing where the units are, uh, it will apply that across the board every single time. Uh, as far as the other stuff with the, the dispatch changes, uh, we've already reprogrammed a lot of the radios. Uh, we've already started the process of redesignation. Uh, we just need to realign a little bit more of our system. Um. Ultimately, what's that going to cost Edwardsville? Is it going to cost us ten, eight, fifty, and five thousand? For I mean, I can't see us just getting that for free. I mean, what's it going to cost our tax taxpayers? To that is the actual cost to do that. To do that. Right there. Yeah. And that's like something said, they should have years ago, quite frankly. Yeah. And, and like I said, we mm -hmm. constantly buy technology every year. If we had known that this was going to come in back in June and April or May when we started the budget process, <clears throat> you'd have seen a technology line item of ten thousand eight hundred fifty dollars to buy the upgraded one of those only. Our current tablets are anywhere between three and six years old. We try to replace them out between that four and five year mark. The thing is is if we're gonna do it dry piecemeal one or two lane along the line like we're currently trying to do now and just spread them out over the time and just put new technology and software at one point in time in the hand, then you can get it to that price tag right there. Five thousand dollars for the unit redesignation, that can be as well as my normal operating budget. No, I like I like that. Yeah. It just... But that thousand dollar annual re repainted within the CAD system be added on to meet our normal contractual purposes every year in the budget process. This entire expenditure is easily absorbed oh, yeah. under three plus million dollar budget. No, I can see that, and you know I'm really happy and <coughs> pleased with what I'm seeing here. You know, you always have to be a little cautious when you see something so cheap that yes, you're know, you really getting it for that. The, the, and it's that was the, the, the big concern that we had because you know whenever we did not take the power tech CAD computer software and all that they bought into. <coughs> I mean, Bonner Springs has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars for it. Casey K spent hundreds of thousands. And we opted not to. We had a separate RMS system upgraded to a different one over time. We got a more robust RMS system that works as well in the CAD and the physical configuration parts that are now. Um, our special program is the same as in our same as in our RMS, where they're doing different programs across the command. Trying to get it to talk to the CAD. So for us, we are down to a hardware software thing. And, and that's all that is. Um, like I said, all of our other technology parts, radio airways, and all that, we kept up with the brand, we kept up with the funding, we replaced them all there. So that's why that funding line is that low that it is so correct for like three years each year. Um, I have another note. Uh, I was looking into uh, like the reimbursements. Uh, basically, um, our People get hurt in KCK. That's 
protected by us, right? And or vice versa and all of that. So I, I think I read in the contract where all that was pretty good. Um, what about uh, the reimbursement for the ambulance, like the insurance for transporting? We still retain. So if it's transporting, like we do with a barn train trip, transporting barn train trip, what makes the barn train resident of Pennsylvania submitted to our billing company. And the only the only other thing I was going to ask, and it probably doesn't mean anything anyway, who's the boss? If if you're first responder to KCK, you take control of the situation, then another chief from KCK comes in. Are you in the boss, or does that transfer to who came in? I I mean that might not be the question. I'm seeing a smile. That might not be a question that we want. No, because it's actually been addressed by their chief more than once. Um, same that has occurred even when they've had these situations over here in the past when they challenged the authority of the local part. By the NIMS model, which they've addressed to, it's the first to rise in the fire. Um, 99% of the time, uh, if it's a captain or lower, then you know, there's someone there, and they've already been told you're going to answer to that chief to make sure that you don't show the same respect that you would show any chief around here. They are qualified, capable, and uh, very well educated in their job. Um, it was quite funny because Ruben sat there and said, you know, well, I've known him for almost 25 years, so I've known him longer than you know, I've known most of you guys. So there is that conflict over there. What we've addressed to is that we sit there and we get there first, just like they were to sit there and bring a battalion chief over and take the car over here. We're taking an approach where we're not getting too far away from them saying, okay, here you go. Thoughts, views, or anything, especially when I'm over there. If it's back in their area and I might have started fire operations, it'll be no worse than any other IA and me getting replaced by a senior chief above me by other battalion chief. This is what I've got. This is what I started with. This is the resources I've got dedicated. This is what I've got around. You wanted to let me finish following this through. If I make something over in their area quicker than they do, this is what I've got. This is what I've done. This is what your resources are. This is what's on the road. Do you want it or not? And same thing that occurs even when I go over to Bonner. This is what I started, and a lot of times it's just one of those that everything you started it, both what's bad, we're going to take a hands off approach. That has been addressed on multiple times within conversations, not only at our level, but I've heard it from their chief staff several times from command staff and just those things. So those types of things are under us in their joint training, which is going to be more from what, what the indication was. Is that right, Chief? Yes, sir. So that they're going to be more. <coughs> The incident command system and all those things, fairly universal, are going to be training together. They'll, they'll know the names, the faces, that sort of thing. And I think that'll come pretty yeah. No, I see. That That sounds like a good deal. And getting radios together sounds pretty good, too. I think we dealt with that with the police department on pistols at one time where everybody had this, you know, where you could exchange clips and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's all the question about that. I just have a few. Um, what is our current mutual aid? An automatic aid with Bonner. What is it? Or when was it? What is it right now? I mean, short version. Is there is there a short version? Or is there? Uh, yeah, throw that back to you. Section number five of our agreement, which was passed in December uh, of 2018, uh, it's section number five and some of the other ones as well that were at least considered is the same thing. In addition to the assistance provided pursuant to the agreement. For significant emergencies, the parties may agree to provide automatic aid to each other in accordance with policies and procedures mutually prepared and adopted by the chiefs of each of the department. And they have done that. What they've got together is they said, okay, well, when we have this, for example, there's a structure fire in Bonner Springs. Right? They, they, they're, our response, our apparatus response is we're going there. We're getting dispatched along with this right? and vice versa. That's the thing. Now, if their ambulances, for example, no different than ours, are not are, are committed somewhere else and they're not available, then we would go run that EMS call. That's all 
done through dispatch and request, of course, a mutual aid request, or it can be done automatically. And there were policies and procedures put in place over the years since 2018 that kind of addresses those things. So no ambulance, yeah. there's a heart attack at the post office in Bar Springs. Yeah. And so what did we do? They were not available. Our EMS service yeah. went there and took care of it. And all the things that you've asked, we made the response. It was somewhat automatic, dispatched, and we built a patient. But that's, uh, it works <clears throat> very similar. It's somewhat similar that you just heard presentation wise. Those those in, uh, kind of themes are run through these consistently through these mutual aid agreements. This would just add Kansas City, Kansas. Right? And, and that's and, what I okay. And closest, right? Who's ever closest? So that's really the key changes is that we're going on the fire calls, vice versa. We're going on these ambulance calls when we're needed, and that's that's going to be very consistent. And now we're just expanding in KCK, not only going there but receiving as well. So the biggest change is KCK's in the mix now. Yeah. Okay, because on the page nine, it states Bonner Springs request of Edwardsville and Edwardsville request that stays the same. So I just wanted to refresh. What is our current agreement? So nothing changes there. Nothing changes that other than. All our runs out there. Yeah, there, there's really two prongs here is that we have to mutual aid where we say, would you come and help us, and vice versa, or you're already going, right? Because there's some automatic technologies involved, right? And they say, you're close, go, and we're going to save the patient or do whatever, right? So that's that's really the two prongs. Mutual aid, we're asking, right? Vice versa, exchanging services, and the auto piece, right? Right, then? Yes, sir. I'm right along. Uh, is right that on. we, we are being dispatched directly because we've agreed that if we're the closest unit, there's probably limited availability of anyone else we're going to go to. And if I understand it correctly, doesn't it shorten the uh, response time when it's automatically? Yes. Because if you're from estimates right now, nationwide traffic, and then we're paying a plan to have you know, people going down, shut you know, the real traffic, has to be dispatched and go over with stuff and everything. Like I said, we know we're here with us, the way the current dispatch situation is, it's going to shave 90 seconds or more. That is the, that is the shoot time the fire department is going to have to go on. So that is already putting that resource that much closer, that much further on the road. And I had a couple more questions. Do you oh. know what the response time, I mean, I don't know if you know this, the response time from Station 6 to, say, this area would be? About the same as ours is from here to Station 6 this area, which is right at 6 minutes. <laughs> And then, um, does our fire truck, do they have a paramedic on the back? Yes, ma'am, most of the time. Okay. Now, we are still, it is pretty later on, we're still working on it the paramedic staffing, but that's why we sat there and told the council back in, I believe it was August, that our goal is to go to the AEP. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of some drugs. Um, there are state narcotics that puts that advanced life support skill um, out there. We got it through the medical director. We're working it through for EMS on spike, training it myself. But that was the former Lawrence Douglas County method of when we don't have paramedics, advanced EMTs are designed for rural areas. We have got time to get you to the hospital. We're not using all the medic skills on every call. So our goal of going with this is do we keep the medic now back on the See the truck in case we have that more critical call and put the AEMT on the ambulance because if the medics need it, they get on the ambulance. If not, it's safe for the more critical call to be. It's just a work in progress to implement that now. I have one more comment right. question, sorry. And it's more for the language how this is written. So the very first paragraph on page one of ten. This agreement is made and entered into on this first day between Kansas City, Kansas Fire Department, Bonner Springs, <clears throat> Kansas Fire Department of Fire EMS, and Edwardsville, Kansas Fire Department. Should they all be fire EMS? And then you go to page two, a very top line and or renew an automatic and mutual aid agreement <clears throat> for fire department services. But then you go through in the body of this and it it talks about fire and or EMS service, fire and or EMS. I 
Should that be consistent? Well, part of that is just titling. So our ambulance is titled under the Illegal Fire Department. And City of Kansas is ambulance is titled under the Kansas City Kansas Fire Department. Bonner Springs may be very much like the Tennessee Street Settler General Separate. Service and is still licensed under the Bonner Springs EMS Service. They're not a fire based EMS service. Exactly. But throughout the, the body, it, it says fire EMS yes. everywhere. So I, it's just a <clears throat> maybe a little nitpicky, but it's a contract or an agreement. Just right. something to look at. It's been vetted legally several times. Right. Three different. Uh, just for consistency. Right? So just a lot of conversation you have uh, yeah, yeah. by human lawyers. So. <laughs> <laughs> Not the AI one. <laughs> Just a comment. So, do, do you find any in the language that she pointed out? Any they, they're somewhat consistent. They're consistent, but it's always best practice to use the same when you're referring to different um, parties or okay. organizations. We can do that. And then, like you mentioned earlier, the identification clause. It's always important to get that right. And I would agree that um, the way we draft it. Someone takes over care, it's their processes and procedures that need to be followed. Not that there's anything specific duty to identify who you're there. Yeah, that's a fairly long council. Um, I did have a suggestion that we not necessarily rescind every previous mutual uh, aid agreement, that we just provide. In this agreement, that if anything is in contract that contradicts any of those previous mutual aid agreements, um, the district control that just provides for some consistency. If for some reason we're undoing, you know, some sort of working relationship that wasn't covered, yeah, I think that leads to you push down on top plate to come to a new automatic mutual aid agreement because we had the existing signed one with Bonner Springs, and seems like we had the existing drafted one. Has been drafted guys that are signed by the UG as well, where that might be for some reason. And then there's side agreements that, you know, when Ms. Mayne brought up, you know, we don't want to remove all of them because there are agreements that they're part of the Eastern Kansas Metro Task Force for the arson. We're part of the, so uh, it was also brought up by Ms. Mayne and one of the other uh, attorneys that we sit there to put in the language we remove all. The existing agreements, then we have to go back and redo all of our other agreements that are outside of this as well. So that's where I that language has stayed in to do the terms to cover that. I did have a couple of questions and, and, and a comment or two, but um, I, this is great. I, I really applaud your efforts, and I, I know that you put a lot of effort into this, and it's it's been a long time coming. And I think with Bonner, you know, becoming what they're becoming, and having their own fire department, I think it's making it make it a realization that this is happening. So great job on, you know, working on this and spending all the time on it. Uh, also, I also had the same question as uh, Mr. Malad about uh, who, who the incident commander was going to be if all three agencies were there. And I, and I believe I heard you say that basically the first one that's there and that's agreed upon by all everybody that that'll be the incident commander under the NIMS organizational chart. a call that is odd or unique or not really of this this powerhouse and then here comes the Kansas City Kansas Battalion Chief is on our response he's got 30 years of experience in it he's done this more so that captain can sit there and say here you go you, you've got more time and experience in this and it happens all the time it happens in Johnson County it happens across the nation as a plan to put it that there's that situation, somebody's going to come across something and says, I just don't have the knowledge, skills, and abilities, or I'm completely overwhelmed. And it's all about helping the community and helping the department. So <clears throat> there's a reason for it. Nobody's just going to come in and say, here you go, I've got a table. It used to be the case for differing tactical decisions that has occurred on fires where I make a tactical decision, and if they're on the same call with us, 
They were only taking answers from Herbert Tang and Jesus. Those were really two separate opposites to tackle the decision. They had a part of it, though, more than once as well. Because it, there, when that gets caught again, it's not going to be pretty. So it puts it all back into the first arriving fire official making those decisions. Mm -hmm. Under the Nimitz model, the first arriving fire official makes those decisions. So, A, they've been relieved by somebody that's more experienced because they've given it up. Or there's a creation of more of a fire approach. And we see more of a, not so much senior vice manager, but it goes outside. Mm -hmm. It goes outside of the dial of that. You don't look as far as anybody else. Right. It's just uh, number 18 of page 4 mm -hmm. and number 32 of page 6 addresses yeah. both of those concepts. So it is an agreement that they all parties agree. It's the command system and the yeah. NIMS model. Yes, that's perfect. I'm glad it's I'm glad it's in there. And then I think you mentioned something about the I know it was in your presentation uh, on the North Station, you know, that we've talked about and we've heard from some of our residents. So with this with this model, with this mutual aid and which with this agreement, when it goes in place, what's your opinion on our need for that North Station? goes in. It doesn't mean that we're never going to have it up there. But if I were to sit there and get told today that, hey, you need to put two people in the ambulance up there, it's going to cost you X, Y, Z dollars. And understand that that two-person ambulance is not going to be in that station all the time and forever because the majority of our call volume is down here. <coughs> As a taxpayer, the city of Edwardsville is going to cost me X amount of dollars out of my tax bill every year. Mm -hmm. So, Part of fiscal stewardship is giving you information to make the appropriate decisions on tax levies. That understanding that the nine people that are being required in that facility is an eight hundred thousand dollar hit that is payroll and salaries right off the bat. I look at the budget. I don't see eight hundred thousand dollars that's playing around to put in there. It does not exclude us the bill that goes in there from saying we're not going to staff that station. But it is increasing the capabilities that we have in the north end until we get to that staffing point. It is taking the closest resources. We are not the closest resources. I mean, it's a three and a half mile drive. This is the yeah. difference. The further you get to the 98 Riverview, the further are you are away from here. But it takes that closest resource approach. And that closest resource approach may be four and a half miles. But it beats a three and a half mile response because they're going downhill and down one road instead of us trying to transfer up three or four and going back to several different roads. Yeah. So that's where that comment comes into. It doesn't replace the whole process. It's not going to replace us at North End Road. But this helps fill that gap for those concerns for North End residents that as it goes in, when that time comes, I will be the first one to have to walk in here and say, look, we're all going to have to sit there and let our pocketbooks. We're going to have to staff because we've had an influx in population and an influx of calls and an influx in resources. But again, for less than 6 percent of the calls, I'm going to give the numbers of last spring. You're talking about there was 13 medical calls and 24 fire related calls. That was the entire call on the north of Williamson Farm. I think I think your numbers are are good for us all. No, I mean it's good for our residents to hear that. I know you and I have talked a little bit about this extensively as well, and I believe you said the equipment wise we're probably good on right now. We're good, you know. Uh, if we needed to put you know equipment up there, but staffing, you know, you you told me that we were short on staff on filling those, and it'd be a a pretty substantial hit. But I I think I do remember you saying that if we if we did make that decision to to add a second station, 
that we would be able to, we'd qualify for additional grant money. Is that correct for those funding of those? Yes, if, if you can sit there and they'll push that North Station, as long as it's paid for grants, are going to uh, still be funded every year because of house appropriation needs. Uh, it will give us a better chance because we're not trying to create more time back that was the time station. Yeah. That's why both Kansas City, Kansas, and um, Olathe were uh, awarded grants again this year, and why Kansas City, Kansas has been awarded more safer grants than we have because we're only detailed one person per ship. Right. Uh, where the federal priorities are, uh, a bit more of the let's staff an entire station provide more appropriations that way, that would put us in a higher rating caliber because we would be holding the new station. That would be a bigger physical burden on the community. No, that's great. I, I think it's good, again, to have the discussion and have those numbers, you know, on record. Uh, that way, just everybody involved has an idea of what that expense is going to be when when our residents are asking, you know, for that North Station to, to be what we're talking about. And I think this mutual aid agreement, I think, once we have a year or two or three years under our belt, we'll see what those call numbers are like, see what that traffic is like, and also see what our north development becomes here in the next two or three, four or five years. Uh, and then we, we can readdress it. Mm -hmm. And again, it's our discretion. Yeah. The work is committed to it. It's our discretion. If we don't have the resources, it's not going. To yeah. Work. That's great. And, and eight hundred thousand dollars is a is a big spike into a budget for just the salaries. There's no facility. Even if we sat there and looked at more facilities, it's got to something's got to happen with public works. Yeah. And it's going to take a massive or extensive overhaul of that facility because it was never designed for living crews. Mm -hmm. You have to worry about sleeping arrangements. You have to worry about restroom facilities and cooking facilities, which that station doesn't have. You know, so that's when we're talking about dollars. We're just talking about that. That is budget payroll salary. You know, initially, yes, you can get by splitting some of these overheads, but as you have more equipment, then you've got to have another back reserve. And that's, that is a decision that I keep trying to tell everybody. Let's not. Jump into real quick and let's do it strategically. We can plan for over the DC mm -hmm. and along so the government body can make decisions going, is this the time that we execute step A? Do we execute hiring three in over the next three years, three per year, so we're not in that more than eight hundred thousand dollars spike at one time? The bottom line is it's not financially feasible. That building isn't equipped to hold any of that. Right. That's not even the right location as far as we can tell development wise and things. I just think that it, that's really, we're looking five, ten years where we can start studying about probably where we need to be. And then when it comes to the North End Fire Station, every economic development program or proposal that's come through my office, I have said, if you're having this land, could you then feed some of it for a fire station in the future? That's my, one of my first comments. You've got plenty of this acreage. Are you going to use it all? Is it on this particular area? So that's the first thing we're thinking about is, getting the land acquisition first because we know that's just simply not mm -hmm. and it's good to have the conversation and know the information to talk to the constituents about but in a sense it's just not financial either. right the run volume doesn't support it whatsoever and i think you made a great point mr scott is that we have a potential from a north fire station to come south and that may have an even faster response and better service just through this agreement alone so i, I just think maybe that's more of a future conversation Right now, right. Let turn sixes into our north end station and for if right now. Residents of the north end and closer resources <clears throat> if this is signed and that resource is available out of six on January the first at eight o'clock in the morning, they may see the KCK because it's where they see our residential resource. <laughs> that at the end of the day is a benefit to any resident of the <laughs> <clears throat> um, 
Nope, that's all I got. Just great job again. I appreciate <clears throat> everything you do. Well, I'd like to a couple things. <clears throat> the sixes station is closer, but they always man that station with an ambulance. If, if sixes goes out, somebody gets fills in there. So it's not like we're going to be without one. You know, they always fill it in on the first things that happen. Um, I've sat in a dispatch center, and when you get a call from KCK, the dispatchers, and then you get one from Edwardsville, and you get one from Bonner Spring, it's a mess because they have to switch from using this microphone because they have a, they used to have foot pedals. <clears throat> yeah. Where you, oh, this one's Edwardsville, this is Bonner, I can't talk to this person. This will reduce our uh, response times I, drastically, I believe, because there were some times you'd be sitting in there and it's, well, we're trying to dispatch this one, but we can't because we're dispatching this one. So I think I love this. Pro I wish this would have happened a long time ago because it's, you know, it's it's been needed for years and years. So I am um, I'm all in favor. Of Thank you, Chief, for the presentation. We, we really appreciate it. I think um, we've got a little bit of time. This is a lot to, to talk about and absorb and think through. And so. Here over the next couple of weeks, if council has any further questions um, for Chief, go ahead and, and send those. I know he answered a lot of mine this evening, and I really, really do appreciate that. Yeah, I encourage you to send a message, and we'll get something to you in writing and answer it. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Um, it's also really great to hear that Bonner's uh, staffing up. That's really <coughs> Encouraging and, and pulling in the weight of this, and that communications and relationships have gone so far between Edwards and Kansas City, Kansas. Um, I know Chief Whitem has has done a lot of work on this, and so we we really appreciate that. I'd like to reiterate that importance so that the three the three chiefs are getting along so well, and they never have in the past. I think it's just commendable that this is happening. So I I give kudos to Chief Whitem because I think he's probably the one that stirred this up. I got I a, a pretty solid working relationship with Chief Yeah, Bonner, right? and I and I know I know Dennis pretty well too. And, uh, that was the result of working the first two years to get the 18 agreement done because of the way that we were treated all the way. Yeah. Well, I think it's <coughs> just awesome. I think that should make a lot of people on the north end feel a little bit more comfortable and secure because that is definitely a concern. Thank Absolutely, you. you got it. <laughs> Item number four, consider authorizing staff to purchase a Vermeer wood chipper in the amount of forty-two thousand eight seventy-five forty-four, using proceeds from the special sales tax fund. Mayor, thank you, Mayor Council. You have before you is a background. It does say CE Goodall, and he and I look a little different. So, but I'll be <laughs> present. Yeah, he's uh, out today uh, and asked me to take over this. Uh, work. The staff is asking for authorization to purchase this particular wood chipper, which is a twenty twenty-four Vermeer. BC 1000 XL wood chipper uh, for $42,875.44 using proceeds from the special sales tax fund. And the reason we want to use it from there is in a sense that this will be used for parks and streets, and that, that is well qualified to be uh, paid for from that particular fund. The fund is very healthy. We didn't spend out of that as much as we expected to this particular year for a number of reasons. And we had a surplus of $47,000 at the end of the year after it was audited. We had more cash than we expected. So it's very healthy. It's well aligned for this particular purchase. Let's talk about history. Some years ago, we sold a wood chipper under uh, like a purple wave auction type thing. And the folks came, got it, and they rebuilt it, and they're probably using it still today. Uh, but there was some expectation that we would replace it because we used it pretty extensively. And when we were out and about, in recent storms, uh, we were like, well, what's happening? So my new perspective, I asked a lot of questions. I said, well, where's our wood chipper that we should have bought by now? And, and we hadn't purchased one yet. And uh, Director Goodall was saying, yes, we need one. They lease up probably three or four limbs on a pretty regular basis. Every three days, we have trees down somewhere. And if they're not even cutting some back just because there's emergency situation, maybe it got in the road or something like that. But what we do with them is we put them in the dumpster. That's apparently what we've been doing. And we pay somebody to haul those off and that sort of thing. But we don't have opportunities to have any wood chips uh, or even do a service say for a citizen to say, hey, I got this. Could I bring that down there and chip it up or whatever? And offer some opportunities throughout the year that we could mulch up some things and 
use it at the park and that sort of thing. So that was the full discussion there. And I said, please go out, let's look at, it, the, at the, the number of wood chippers that we can, because as you might imagine, there's, there's several to choose from. The first priority was safety, as you might imagine. We don't need an ambulance while, after we use our wood chipper. Right? Uh, so what you see here is the one they went with, uh, which is the Vermeer. It has the number one safety features in this in this kind of line that we were looking at, and within the last week and a half, they dropped the price five thousand dollars. So the price you're seeing here is 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 the price they're offering, and it was five thousand dollars more. You will notice on page two of your background information there were others that they demoed, and they weren't quite as safe. And though it's uh, that tw twenty twenty three four bark or whatever that is, it's thirty four thousand. Yes, but it's not the lowest and best bid. It doesn't have the safety features they were. We have a various staff who might be using it, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And what they really wanted to focus on this uh, this nine inch diameter, so it would feed through there some fairly fairly decent size uh, limbs and logs and that sort of thing. And so after their evaluation, CE Goodall, our public works director, uh, wrote the background memo and is recommending that purchase for forty two thousand eight hundred seventy five dollars. I was going to ask about is there going to be any training on that because they are extremely dangerous. Yes. So yeah. number one, I said safety, and, and you're getting the ones with the the one with the most safety features uh, that we could purchase, and they they will come out and deliver it, <coughs> set it up, show them how to use it, all the stuff with hard hats, glasses, all the good stuff will be a part of it. So. I'm definitely in favor of that. Um, I was going to ask where are you going to keep it. Is well, it going to stay outside in the weather like everything else well, we've got? I think there was an answer similar to that from CE, but in tongue in cheek. But I think he's going to, I mean, that's a pretty hefty investment. We're either going to have the park shelter or the park uh, shed or up at the North Station. Those are the two places that we have availability. Yeah, Mayor, I'd like to make, that that make a motion to approve. Just say, just say. I just toss. I have a, I've owned Vermeer equipment, and you can't hurt them things. I know you just can't tear them up. You can't beat them. Not, I'm familiar with the Vermeer cheaper, uh, wood chippers as well, and they are the best in the industry, and they have a lot of safety factors. And you're absolutely correct, Mark. They they will come out and and train all of the staff. Um, Mr. Goodall, I think he's out sick today. I, I kind of traded some emails with him today about this and. My my question to Mr. Goodall was about you know estimated hours of use or how often you know he if he could guesstimate you know how many hours a a year that he would use one and he really didn't have any even a good estimate I think more about because he was sick uh, but you know when I, I did some research as well and and I had this the same thought about it's I know we can afford it where are we going to keep it. And how often are we going to use it? You know, so I did. I did some calling around, and there's three different agencies or rental agencies in our area that are 15 minutes away from us, and the average rental for one of these wood chippers, uh, wood chippers, is around $300 a day or $950 a week. Um, we could do a lot of rentals, you know, until we really can find, you know, how how badly we need to purchase one, you know, I, I'd almost recommend, you know, maybe for next year, rent, renting one as needed, kind of get an idea of, of usage. Um, and it seems like the first year you really have a lot of wood chipping to do until you kind of get caught up and then it kind of sits around. And I mean, that's, that's my experience with the different companies, excuse me, that I've worked for. Um, so I'd almost recommend not purchasing right now or maybe tabling this until we can talk to Mr. Goodall till he's feeling better. Maybe if he had an estimate on on hours of use where that could kind of justify the purchase or maybe in 2024, just rent as needed. And, you know, the different companies, the Sunbelt, Anderson Rental and Gherkin Rental. And I've got numbers here and locations, you know, if we want to look at that, but uh, maybe just rent for 2024. Kind of see what the hours are you know that we use it for and, and then maybe in 2025 make a decision on purchasing my recommendation because i know they sit and they sit it seemed like they sit more 
you know, they same, seems like it sits for like 10 months out of the year. And then you use it for maybe two months, maybe. And I'm not opposed to buying it, but I, and I know we can afford it, but maybe, maybe just rent to kind of see where we're at on our hourly use. The way I, the way I visualize it as of the last week when they went out and collected three days, three here, three there, whatever they're, you know, cutting one down, parks, for example, to include, you know, we have lots and lots of canopy over the roads. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of trees. So in the sense of if it's just one project area and then you kind of use it, I, I, I would think that they're, they're putting this stuff in the dumpster on a pretty regular basis. And then they would have an opportunity to stockpile it, spread, you know, hey, citizen, come down and load up your truck and take it to your house if you want some of this shipping, that sort of thing. Absolutely. I'm not opposed to the to the rental. I think yeah. that at some point, is it the same product? <laughs> Are we trained on that product? Are we going to get it this week and next week? Right. And what does that cost? Well, as you saw, this one's pulled by a pickup. They would take their pickup to wherever these places are. We're going to pay some staff to bring it back and then figure out, you know, that would be some of the timing issue. Yeah. That's when I visualize it. I visualize, I, I know I've seen up the, the North Station. They could tuck that away if they needed to and then pull it out with a pickup truck because that's what they would be doing. For example, we have this uh, the November, December. It's just unique to this particular year, but uh, they're going to be cutting a number of trees from the parks. That sort of thing as part of this project that uh, Chief Woodham announced, and that, uh, that that would be a perfect use for for something like that. But I'm thinking on a more practical basis that if it's just, I'm, I'm thinking the raceway. How many trees compared to the city of Edwardsville do they have? Just so we yeah. can relate to it. It's no contest. Edwardsville wins all day long. There's trees everywhere. So I would just that would be my only thing is that what does staff have to do to go get one? Is it the same one every time? Are we trained on that? Right? Are we prepared to use it? And is, are we stockpiling and then doing the chipping? You know, that sort of thing. That's the only questions I would have. And see, he is here to answer that, but hours wise, number one, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of hard. It's probably been long enough that he could probably put some time. We haven't used a wood chipper. We've been putting it in a dumpster. So I don't know as we can compare apples and apples really in, in that situation. Yeah, I that, think that would be my comments. You no, know, no, no, I appreciate that. And my experience was more was when I was with Pratt County Highway Department. And we, you know, we had the entire county and uh, a Vermeer wood chipper, matter of fact, worked great. And there's quite a bit of maintenance, you know, extra blades that you've got to have and, and actually three sets of blades, you know, one at the sharpener, one's on the unit and then one's on the, you know, in the shop ready to go on, you know. So there's just, there's some, you know, maintenance things that need to, need to know with, with a, uh, equipment like that. But um, it, it's just my experience. Like I said, I, I would, I think, you know, if if you could plan, which we can, just like you said, you know, you, a project coming up, you you call either one of these companies and you see the availability, and they have one from a six inch on up to twelve inch, and you you know it. I don't know, just a thought. Were those Vermeers? Huh? Were they the Vermeer? Uh, yes, yeah, uh, I believe they were. I think I think um, I believe it was Anderson had a Vermeer. Yeah. I know at least one of them did. We had a pile of brush and big logs at the park just within the last two or three weeks. They obviously came off of streets and so forth. How do they get them from there to the park? You mean it's, well, there were some big logs down there. I mean, like, you know, 12 foot long down by that dumpster where the sand pile is. Oh, yeah, okay. How did they get them from wherever they came from down there? Because I was curious, and then it disappeared. This is the time I don't know is the right answer. Well, and then it disappeared. Did it go in that dumpster? And we, paid, we paid that extra to have the that. The process described off. to me is they're putting them in the dumpster and having someone pay to come and get them out of there. Have hmm. we contacted the UG to ask them how much it would cost to put it in their landfill right up the road where they take trees and debris? That would be a yard waste area. I'm going to mention that. Go ahead. No. I, th I think that what they've been doing is they load it wherever they cut mm -hmm. it from and yeah. to include the assistance of the once a while from the fire department to cut them up, get them out the street, get them out of the right of way, whatever. And then, they, then they're just putting them in the dumpster. And have, I don't know if they're calling it, it fills up and they call them for a special dump or what, what they're doing. So I would say the answer is probably no. Well, I know that original wood chipper we had was in like 1993 or 94. We bought it because we had trees fall down on Newton. And we, I mean, it literally, 
was you could not pass Newton Street. And I think Sowers probably remembers that when we <clears> bought that chipper and it hung around here for a while and then it disappeared. Because I've asked frequently, you know, where'd that chipper go that we had? And I guess you sold it off. We did. It was purple lead. I remember yeah. standing right in front of it while the person picked it up. I, I think several that, years. I'm going to throw the motion out there to approve the purchase of this chipper and just see where it falls. So I'd like to make a motion to approve the Vermeer Great Plains Chipper in the amount of 42875.44. Before anybody seconds that, I want to add that the the drawback to renting one is you you do have to plan it out. And if with the weather coming up that we're could be having with ice, no. there will not be a brush chipper available to rent. You know, everybody's going to have them rented out, you know, with the ice storm and tree limbs down everywhere. So that is a major drawback to renting, uh, especially one in the in the winter time. Um, so I guess that we just got to figure out if. if... I was going to say, I just got a motion to post it. I'll just throw it out there to see what happens. Well, I, I, I do think, and Mr. Mullen has mentioned it over the years, some equipment investment, you know, when, when we, say that hey we have this public works department what kind of things that we want i mean we could certainly use this as a, a citizen service where if we could also rent one and plan for those events but we could somewhat on a whim go get it from our shop and take it to wherever we need it and use it that's convenience that sort of thing but it's an investment and we have to take care of our investment so yeah once again we're back to where do we store it they do have room for that <coughs> object to store up there so we can store it inside uh for what season at all had told me. So I would say that if this goes to that kind of somewhat positive path, even some patching equipment and some of those things where our smaller crews can handle that equipment, I think that's a positive investment. I'll second. We have a motion by Councilman Malott, a second by Councilman Bishop. Will the clerk please call roll? Malott. Yes. Driver. Yes. Scott? N no. Uh, yes. Yes. Moving on to item number five, uh -huh. city manager report. <laughs> I have one thing of no well, you know what I mean? see it in my message to you, uh, but I'll explain it in a little more detail, uh, though I don't have extraordinary amount of detail, so I try to follow up with it. We have, as you, as I mentioned in my correspondence, we received a note, a letter from the U5 government, from this county administrator's office about the yard waste and the household hazardous waste facilities and the dumpster days in Kansas City, Kansas. And essentially, their study that they commissioned suggested that the citizens of Edwardsville are not paying for that and it's not a county service. So, and they've notified Bonner Springs as well. So in the short and simple of it, they want to implement a voucher system that when you take your stuff there at either one of those locations or participate potentially in their dumpster days and or automatically to get those, we're not sure how it work, uh, that there will be a voucher system. The mayor and I have communicated about uh, giving a, a, a unified message maybe, but what we need is more information. So that's why I called today. I haven't received uh, any, I just recently got this. And I haven't received a call back from his office. And I'm hoping to say, well, how is it supposed to work? Because this nicely typed letter doesn't explain how that would work. As, as I, I, I just summated it to you folks, but the mayor, I, I copied a letter because, you know, I don't, I don't know what drove, it may be a cost saving measures that they're studying some of the services that are provided and looking to say, okay, Folks out west, Bonner Springs and Edwardsville, if you're not a part of the KCK residential trash pickup and that sort of thing, you're not paying for these things. And it's not a wind up county effort. Yeah, so, you, you're written all so over the their letter. The questions would be we would like to know how it's not a county landfill effort. Right? That would be the first question. How would the voucher system work? Is it that each citizen is driving up there dumping? They fill out a form or whatever, and then we're billed for it, and then we pay for it, or what, how it's going to work. We just don't know. There's more questions than answers here. But certainly the first top two or three is, what's the process? And oh, by the way, is there something you can show us 
that says we've somehow incorporated in that to the incorporated city limits of Kansas City, Kansas as a city function and not a countywide function, because that would be my point. And I, I read it a little bit um, into it in saying that it was incorporated in their trash service fees. So I think we'd want to see that within their waste management contract. Right. Um, my response uh, with which Chief Mathis knows is, okay, now do pilot and now do the county engineer and now do all the things that we're paying for and we don't get one bit of service from the unified government for. Um, so I think, okay, that's fair. Let's apply it across the board. If we don't get the service, we shouldn't be paying for it is more along the lines of my response. So um, we'll, we'll work toward that. We'll see exactly what their expectation is. And then um, if it's fair, let's apply it across the board going both directions. Um, on this, uh, is there more note on that there? That's all I've got for. for <laughs> we're investigating and we will report back. Okay. We promise. We're going to have a unified front there. Uh, the next piece of that is, well, we're moving. Oh, Could I see a copy of that letter? Could you oh, email sure. me a yeah. copy of that? Just email it to oh, me. Okay. Oh, you want me to email it to you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to look at that. Yeah, all of us. Has it got UG oh. letterhead on it? It does. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, it's Kansas City, Kansas that's doing this. It does say county administrator's office. So okay. More county. Last more I thought we were part of Yeah, really. Okay. Consolidation. Just, just saying. Yes, Scott. And I, I also, I've taken debris in there, you know, and dumped it. And when you have uh, like 16, 20 foot trailers going in there full of tree debris, and, you know, I mean, it's businesses that are dumping in there. You know, there's a lot of things to look at on that. I take a little bitty trailer, you know, with some trees and you've got people unloading, you know, gigantic oak trees and all. So, I, so hopefully next time we can help you ship those up for you. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's city property. <laughs> Well, you're a citizen. I mean, that's we hope that if we can work some sure. kind of a deal, and then I'll I, so then he does it. We can get in, yeah, we can get into the pile of mulch, or pick yeah. up load, and come and get your mulch. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, that's a good idea. I think we need to do things, look into things like that. We're, we're not on for the day after Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, that means we can't. <laughs> very, very light agenda. Uh, the mayor and I communicated several times. We just didn't think it to have a meeting just to have one. So that does mean where there's going to be a little bit of, uh, there's a number of smaller items that will come to the next meeting in December. It's the only one we'll have, but uh, that typically the annual uh, budget amendments, it's a simple paper, your math, the state needs some of that stuff done. Uh, but there'll be a few other things. I, I don't expect it to be overwhelmed. I'm trying to control that agenda as much as I can. That's, that, I'm saying that as a pledge so that we didn't cancel meetings just to get uh, about marathon meetings. So we're going to try real hard keep those to the, to the thing. We have the fee schedule and, and a few other things similar to that, just business stuff that we'll have to pay for. That's my report. You have my correspondence from Friday or Thursday-ish. And uh, another meeting, uh, I know uh, I, I, I did report on uh, our city attorney was out of town, so we didn't really have an update on the pilot and uh, the letter to the attorney general. By the end of the week, he will have a report to me and I'll submit it to you as soon as I have it. And uh, I know they are working diligently. He's going out of town again. I don't know what this guy's doing traveling. Out of town. <laughs> but uh, that's that's my report, man. Okay. Councilman um, Scott. Um, it's, ironically, with the, the challenges that we had tonight with our sound and audio, or maybe it was just the audio, um, I know some of our public uh, residents have also made the comment that our sound system and, and audio is, or in the video is lacking, challenging. I don't know if it's, is it, is it our equipment? Is it the network or what do you, what do you think? Well, it's a little bit of everything. If you talk about the audio, we've already discussed that a little bit. That, that machine just right below, that soundboard right below you doesn't have any more capacity for some of the microphones, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, we just have to investigate the I know when we broadcast, there's a there's a small screen and it isn't getting every one of you on a big screen, that sort of thing. We're still trying to figure out how to do that. And it may be just say the, the type of video conferencing that we're using, maybe different brand, <coughs> that sort of thing. Uh, partly it is, is, you know, Chantal's new to that as well. And, and I haven't even seen some of that. So we haven't really investigated how we can make improvements on the microphone stuff. We may be at capacity no matter what we do, even if we expand the board because of the size of the room and we have these speakers in the ceiling, it may cause some audio feedback problems. 
So we would have to bring in uh, our professional who did this equipment, and that's on our radar. It's been on our radar a couple of months now. We're just kind of settling in some other mm -hmm. things. And maybe at the turn of the year, we'll have you know, funding resources and that sort of thing and get some quotes about how we can do it better. Uh, this is pretty static as a, as a video camera. Uh, it doesn't get any, if you're presenting from back here, it's not picking yeah. up any of that. So I think there's some limitations. Just we need professionals to come in and say, this is what it's going to take to improve what you have and expand upon it and make it better for, it's more about that video conferencing piece as well. So getting all that kind of coordinated. We do have somebody who can do that. that did it before. Well, I think it's important. I, I think, I don't know how many people, you know, was concerned about it, but I think it's, it is important for everybody that can't get to our meetings to be able to see it and, and hear it. And I think it does have some validity of having a camera back in the back to see the, you know, other presenters, or I think, I think we, it'd be nice if we could get a quote or look at what we have and kind of move forward with trying to up, get our systems updated and kind of get caught up with the times. It was, it was noted on our project sheets. We just don't include it formal of the big projects, but it's something we talked about, I think, really early on in the last since July that we've had as notes we've had issues. We we encourage the citizens to report back what, what issues they might be having. We have fiber connection here, so we should not have any there you go. problems other than our internet service provider spectrum. Mm -hmm. so we're at their mercy. No, I know what you're talking about there. And and so just kind of along with that with our systems, um I, I'd like for us and the mayor to to reconsider you know, allowing uh, council and or our lawyer and or our staff to comment after our public has spoken. Um, I, I think the answer was, and I think you asked a question earlier, you know, when you, two years ago, when you came on, uh, you know, can we respond? And I think the response was because of liability concerns were urged not to comment. But I, I think in the grand scheme of things and with our public taking time out to be able to come down and and ask questions and, and for us to be able to hear what they're talking about and they're concerned about, if we if we have an answer, or even if we don't have the answer, at least uh, uh, consider making that comment. I, we don't have your answer, we hear you, but you know, the mayor could direct whoever to, to find the answer for whoever's talking or whatever the question is. I think, you know, the communication needs to be two way and when you look at the you know definition of good communication it's it's two way and you know when you when our public is coming in and making comments it just feels off you know that we can't respond to them even if we don't know the answer at least say we hear you we understand josh could you look into that mr mathis could you look into that uh, just something along that line i think would be beneficial well, those are things we can say and have been said hey staff could you research that could you get an email and do that and that's very appropriate. I think the mayor hit it on the head previously, and I'm I'm just talking from a layperson. You mentioned liability. Put that word aside because that doesn't fit here. It's not about liability. It's about the agenda that we set. This is a business meeting of the city. Now, if you want to have a side conversation with people who can speak, you can do that as a per all day long in your in your role. You can have those conversations, and you can have those conversations now to go on official record. Hey, I I thought about the comments that this person made develop this area like this, you know, maybe they come in and comment. You could say it at this particular time and say, I agree with you and that citizen, let's let's see what we can do. You can say, staff, go and do these things and make the research piece of it, but you don't want to change the formal adoptive agenda because now you have, you have a rule of three minutes and the reason that is, is you don't want to be here 10 hours of one person dominating your conversation. Right. So this is a business meeting of the city run by the mayor statutorily ordinance wise this is how it works right and so that agenda is set and then adopted right so that's the formal process it's not we're trying to exclude but it's not a workshop it's not a citizen forum those are other venues so that that's kind of not to be curt about it or, or overly frank but in the sense there's no liability in it whatsoever. okay i mean you know people come with suggestions all the time you can say okay we'll take that in advisement staff could you do that that's very appropriate to do i just think we Correct me if I'm wrong. We trick if we allow that, then we're we're changing the agenda because it's not an agenda item that they may be presenting for. They may comment on an agenda item, say number six. I want you to vote yes. They could do that all day long. So and you can consider that what they say. 
So does that kind of explain it? I, I think you hit it on the head, that Mayor, that we don't want to change the formal agenda. I know it's awkward, I know it's tough, but that's kind of how business should be done under Mr. Roberts' rules and under how this thing should be done. Yeah, I think that does help because I, I the way I understood it, we couldn't say any any comments. So if we can say we hear you and we can say, you know, if one of you can, you know, check that out for us, get the information, you know, for the whoever's talking, I think it'd be very helpful. Okay, thank you. Would you like staff to look into that? <laughs> the mayor typically takes on that. Okay, that's perfect. That that helps. That definitely helps. That's all I got. Thank you. Councilman Travis. Uh, <laughs> Chief Woodham, thank you for all your hard work. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of council members up here recognize all your hard work and your possible leadership um, getting Bonner and KCK and Edwardsville together to collectively work on a Wyandotte County mutual aid agreement. There's so many differences between the cities and Wyandotte County. That's a different discussion. But for our residents up, up in the northern end of Edwardsville, I think how you explain station six that is much better than what we would have right now correct yes, sir. and maybe we'll have to I, i'm sure you will monitor the next several years see how the calls go and next year especially see how this new aid goes <clears throat> hoping and because like you said the end of the day it's our wyandotte county residents that top priority so my applause to you and all who are working to make this a success um, Christmas tree lighting now we is that going to be before the next meeting it is <coughs> oh you were probably going to mention that so <laughs> I know well you would you right I don't want to take anybody so I'll let pardon me it is hard to be last. So I'm not, right, that's all I have. Thank you. I know, I'll let everybody else talk. Thank you. Uh, a few little items. Chief Whitman, thank you so much. And uh, I know sometimes I <coughs> say things the way I should, but I'm gonna say that I've never seen cooperation between the three fire departments that we're seeing right now. And that's got to be a good thing. It's just gotta be a good thing. Thank you so much for the work on that. Um, Mark, I was going to ask, uh, I have some residents and church members from the St. Martin in the Field Church. Yep. What's going on with the negotiations for the property to get to the historic Black Cemetery? Well, we got to be careful, but they want well, too much money for the property. It's bottom line. Is it dropped or are we still negotiating? Um, we pretty much said there was a time there, there was discussion of them deeding that over to us and that moved into money. That money is too much, and uh, that's where we're at. Kind of left it in their hands to say, I received a message from them some time ago. I responded back to them saying, uh, we would consider uh, deeding that over, uh, but this price is just not something that we're going to consider. Uh, that's as fair a statement as I can. Yeah, I'm not a, a real estate agent by any means, but I think that we still should pursue that and try and figure out some kind of a, of a way of getting access to that. Because I mean, it would be on, going on private property. And they've always been good to us. Anyway, that's the, uh, I was going to mention about the, uh, the recycle situation and which we've already discussed, but I think it's kind of a slap in the face if they say you can't bring your, your debris in here. You know, I, I, that's got to be looked into. Yeah, I understood that one way or the other, someone's going to pay for it. Well, it's got UG written on a letterhead, you know, and I'm, I mean, I, I look at those little things like that. And they want to blanket it out as you do. Well, if it's KCK, put KCK on the letterhead and say, you're not, you know, you're not, we're the little brothers that don't ever get what we should get. Um, I had, uh, I'm not going to mention silent crossings. I guess I just did. There's, no um, there's still a wire down on 102nd at 15th Street. Yeah. It's been down for a year or so, maybe more. It needs to be put up. Mr. Goodall contacted whomever owns that, and we're at their mercy. Okay. I think it's just, it's number one, it's unsightly, and I don't know, it could be dangerous. I don't know. 
but I would have to uh, I would have to say that needs to be fixed. And has the CPPS board ever had any discussion about what to do with the property that we purchased at the next to Candy's Corner up here across um, from the I, bank? I do recall from just a briefing at that meeting, and, and uh, Margaret McIver was there uh, that that there was mention of maybe even uh, maybe on surface a dog park or something. There's there's green space there. Uh, there, it's not incorporated into our master park plan because that came after, of course, of us acquiring that property. Uh, but what kind of green space was the discussion? I think it was introduced, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mr. Driver, but uh, there's discussion, and I know they have a meeting this week, and hopefully uh, that will uh, be, we'll get some guidance on what they would like. I know staff was a little bit steering that there's potential for a little bit of dog park over there because of the way that the property is laid out and with some simple parking. So that was at least one idea. Again, there's an overlay related to that particular piece of property. Uh, that we saw presentations over the years about you know what was going to happen in that whole area, and I believe uh, our city planner uh, had looked at that previously about what. What kind of space it would be used at, and our guidance was talk to the talk to the board and see what they thought about it. And one of the kind of this looks like a pretty good idea was a somewhat of a dog park, a green space dog park next door. Okay, I think there should be some a little bit of parking put in there somehow, yeah. some city parking because uh, there's little problems with the bank, you know, allowing people to park there for the Grill Thirty Two, and for is it Candy's Corner? Is that the name of that place there? The, Oh, the new the new shop, yeah, yes. Eclectic shop, right? But she's kind of needing some parking too there, and I think if we got a business down there, we need to kind of help them a little bit if yeah, we can. I, I think we tread lightly on building public. I understand that parking for a private business. I, I understand that. So we would build a parking four stall, five stall for the dog park, right? Right. We could do that. Should, should there be there. overflow? Mm -hmm. sure there's ways around that, but I think you got to be good neighbors. <laughs> And, uh, but they are working on it. The answer is yes. Thank you for that. I think I'm done. Okay. Councilman Bishop. Yeah, I would. I think we should. And I mentioned this before. I think we should look into now that Isaac Groves has been uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame. I think we should look into buying his house because before it's deteriorated so bad that we have to just tear it down, and then that's a part of our history, you know. And plus, we own. Well, we could. It's in the land bank. There's a chunk right here. It's owned by somebody. We had to tear the house down. But all this is all land bank. I mean, maybe we could figure out a way of incorporating something, you know, to honor his memory. Because, I mean, without him, we wouldn't be here. Wait a minute. Who is it? Isaac Groves, the Junius. potato king. Junius. Junius. Oh, Junius. Okay, have, I'm, sitting I'm sorry. Here. Isaac Who Groves. Who are you talking about? My, Isaac, he's one Who of my Who are you talking I'm about? <laughs> yeah, it's one of my salesmen. I'm sorry. But, uh, Julius, that's what I'm talking about. I'm sorry. Junius, yeah. yes. Yeah, but I mean, I, 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 before it's too late, you know, because I mean, the house is it's in pretty bad shape. And would, would it be somewhat of a just a historical marker, a museum of some sort well, that somebody could go in? What, yeah. what would be the I purpose? think we could get some funds from the state, you know, the Historical Society, and, you know, I'd be willing to volunteer some of my time, you know, fixing it up and everything. Mark, where is the house? 98th and K32 on the northwest corner behind that branch brick house there. It's a stone house. It's kind of small. It's not like his mansion he lived in. Northeast. Northeast corner. That's right. North Steel. Yeah. And we own some of that. We could own some of that property, you know. And something, you know, just, you know. Across from that this, car lot, that old car lot? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's right across. Yeah. 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 So is there... Is there momentum, uh, some consensus that we should spend some time maybe researching uh, to do some of a real estate deal and, and buying land bank land and things like that? Is there, is there some interest? I think Mark ought to buy it. it he's, he's getting, it he makes all the money. Mark, you buy it. Uh, Mark I pointed at Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, like, I don't know, I just because it's getting in, I was over there the other day. I didn't go in it, but I just pulled up to it, was kind of looking at it. And, you know, I, I just think something should be done. You know, is it for sale? Well, Mike, I, Mike and Webb and I talked about it one time, and he 
said that they had, people have approached him about purchasing at one time. Mike did, and his family was just not really too keen on selling it. Okay, $600. But it, I mean, it's, you know, he said, without him, we wouldn't be here, you know? Well, I, certainly we could, we could uh, you know, track down, maybe, maybe look at whatever. They've done some research in the past on the same question. Uh, staff could do some research, maybe reach out to the folks and, and look at, you know, there's some land bank property right there as well. You could want to maybe incorporate that so yeah. they can close on. If that's something you're interested in, we could sort of put the time into it. Sure, if you've got the time. I mean, if it's not too much, too much. I mean, I'll check with, I mean, I could check, I could do some research on it myself with the historical society because we, we deal with them sometimes. Certain planning and zoning would have some access yeah. to certain records and things like that, make it a little easier for us and stuff. So if that's... Well, I think we need to, when, when we're hearing about our, we're getting audited, we've got below our, our, um, marks that recently lowered our, our credit, credit score. Yes. Yes. We've, um, we just talked about a cemetery that we're, you know, in the middle of discussing. We just talked about a park space right by the railroad, potentially. I, we want to make sure we're not spreading ourselves so thin. So I, I do think that we probably need to prioritize some of these projects and say, okay, which direction do we need to head in instead of pursuing three different potential, um, Absolutely. not even economic development, but uh, purchase. I might suggest ideas. that this would be a parks and open space type project. Maybe they are the one we send this to and say, what would you prioritize the historic cemetery? <laughs> this or these other other park investments. Maybe that's something we could do if that's your direction, Mayor. I, I'm open to whatever we might do. I, at least you would have a community board kind of kind of here, here's the idea. What do you what do you guys think about this? Is this a priority for this particular year coming up? That sort of thing. We don't know any pricing. We don't know what it's going to take once we own it. What do we have to do immediately to set and salvage it? That sort of thing. So there's there's a certain level sure. work. But that's at least right. an idea we could take it to the CPPS board as a, do you think this would be a priority for the That would be a good idea, because I think all of these would fall, I mean, they're all great ideas. We just need to kind of pick where to go so we're not in limbo on three things with all of these other things going forward. We can't, we don't have the capacity to staffing or financially to do that. Um, so, we can discuss Margaret, do you think that would be, sure. okay, yeah, I think that would be a good idea bring it to CPPS board and um, have them kind of prioritize some things and see what, what direction are we wanting to move in. Okay. Uh, I believe CEO should be in tomorrow. He and I will have a discussion so we can kind of leave that discussion <laughs> and, and kind of go we can discuss maybe what finances might be and that sort of thing. So is that, yeah, yeah that, I would think we would turn it over to the park board anyway. Yeah. We, <clears throat> I believe we ordered some signage at some point. I don't know if we followed through with that, but there was some decided that we were going to put the Groves sign up or something to that effect. And whether, that was, we, uh, whether or not we worked that or not. That was about a year ago. Yeah, it's been a little while. Right. Zach's gone. That's all I got. Okay. I think about my Sorry. Councilman Adcox. Um, Chief, just thank you for the work on the automatic aid. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to it. It seems really good. It seems good for everybody involved. I'm just thankful that all the departments are getting along and look like they're going to have a good, working, respectful relationship together. That's it. And Councilman Mallott had one. I, did, I wanted to mention, Mark, maybe could you, uh, on that report that, or the uh, interlocal agreement that we're doing, mutual aid agreement, could they put a little blurb in the hot shot to let the citizens know what's hot on the table right now and that? I think that would be a good idea with that passing of a sales tax, which is going to help quite a bit. And with, with, with what we're doing with the fire department, with, with chiefs doing with the fire department, I think that public needs to know that right now. We will feature it. I mean, beyond, you know, beyond just what we're doing right here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to take the keep it brief. Um, December 5th, mark your calendars, please. We have the, Edwardsville Mayor's Christmas tree lighting event coming up should be a great time. We have more community involvement than ever before. Um, Edwardsville choirs coming. Um, we will have the Edwardsville 
I'm sorry, Edwardsboro, Bonner Springs High School drumline, and then just got confirmation today that we'll have um, some of the performing arts students uh, participating as well. So it'll be a really big year. Hope you have a great turnout. So everyone mark your calendars for that. I am probably strangely excited about the yard of the season coming to pass. Um, that will be announced here uh, probably within the next 24 hours, I'd imagine, on Facebook. We had a yard of the season competition for the fall, and um, folks submitted their uh, nominations to the CPPS board who picked um, our winner for the fall season. Uh, that will be announced on Facebook. They'll get a gift card and a little sign in their yard for a week. And then um, we're going to approach the uh, Christmas season and have a yard of the season for that as well. So um, just to put that on everyone's radar as they're probably putting up their Christmas lights this week. Um, we had the Edwardsville Mobile Pantry last Saturday. Thankfully, we had uh, really good weather considering it was November. Um, we served over 16,000 pounds of food to over, well, to 846 people. And that's including um, the high rise and stocking up our local pantry, Von Trent. Um, since you brought up the, the unified government, I will just take a little uh, second to let folks be aware that we do have the um, meetings, community meetings coming up. You can find those dates on Facebook, the Unified Residents of Wyandotte County page. We have an Edwardsville meeting, November 20th. There are several other meetings throughout the Wyandotte County area. Feel free to come to any of those meetings. You just sign up online. We would love to hear how you feel like the Unified Government is working for you. Thank you. Ready? <laughs> Went longer than 45. I thought it was going to be too.